19 inches of torrential rains falling in 60 hours over six northeast states bring about the worst flood disaster in recorded American history. Already drenched by the downpour accompanying Hurricane Connie a week previous, swollen streams run amok through one of the most populous and industrial sections of the nation. Pennsylvania, part the of... The flood of August 1955 was the greatest natural disaster in Connecticut's history. It killed 75 people and it laid waste to the state's industrial heartland from Winstead and Waterbury to Ansonia and Derby. Rivers that were swollen by the most intense rainfall that was ever recorded in Connecticut had breached their banks and pounded many towns with a violence that none who survived it can forget. In a dramatically brief period between the 18th and 19th of August, the flood caused so much destruction and heartache that the nation mobilized quickly to ease the suffering. Within hours of the first reports of disaster, helicopters swarmed over Connecticut. They rescued the stranded and they ferried supplies to relief centers that were hastily constructed on high ground. When the waters receded late in the day on the 19th, it became clear that the flood had altered the landscape and had overturned the lives of thousands of people. And memories of the catastrophe would linger for generations. Over the first half of the 20th century, as industry and population grew, floods swept through Connecticut's river valleys with increasing damage. In March 1936, abnormally heavy spring rainfall combined with fast melting snow produced spectacular floods that inundated Hartford and other towns on the Connecticut River. The flood killed three people and left 14,000 homeless and it spurred calls for flood control projects to protect the homes, the industry, and businesses. Two years later, the great hurricane of 1938 pummeled the shoreline, then it pushed inland, killing 55 in all. The damage sparked the construction of dikes in the Connecticut River near Hartford. However, plans for other controls gathered dust as the Second World War and local distress of the federal government stalled those proposed projects. In 1941, the Army Corps of Engineers completed a report on the Housatonic River and its tributaries, including the Naugatuck and the Sheepog Rivers. The Corps urged Congress to approve construction of a dam and reservoir on the Naugatuck River in Thomaston to protect the heavily industrialized valley downriver. The Corps reported that floods far exceeding that of 1938 may be expected. Such greater floods would cause serious loss of life and property by overflowing the highly developed areas of Waterbury, Ansonia, and several other cities. In 1944, Congress authorized engineering studies, but the Thomaston Dam and Reservoir would not be constructed until 1960. Between the turn of the century and the 1950s, towns in the valley had been transformed from isolated New England mill villages into integrated industrial powerhouses. The valley bashed metal, it bent copper, and it molded rubber in three shifts a day. By the 1950s, more than 200,000 people filled the narrow belt that stretched from Winstead in the north to Ansonia in the south. Waterbury became its center, and streets with names such as Main and Church were the focal points of each town. Naugatuck was a uh, pretty active town in those days because they had the uh, Union Oil, at that time it was the uh, United States Rubber Company, and uh, they employed about 7,000 people in town. Uh, the town itself was very active. Once it was a small New England manufacturing town with a main street of about a mile or a mile and a quarter that had buildings on both sides, a narrow main street, a byplay between businesses across the street. You couldn't move the traffic downtown in Winston on a Friday night and a Saturday. I worked for the first national store through high school, and uh, our big night was Friday night, and Saturday was busy until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
They were shopping, visiting back and forth, and the popular thing was to go downtown and shop in downtown Winsett in the center of town. And uh, people, you, they'd crowd together to be walking, the sidewalk would be crowded with people, the stores would be crowded with people on Friday nights. So. The summer of 1955 had been dry and unseasonably warm through July and into early August. On August 12th and 13th, the eastern edge of Hurricane Carney dumped torrential rains on New England, it saturated the ground, and filled the beds of small streams that ran from the forested hills and fed the major rivers. Less than a week later, another hurricane, Diane, moved northward across the Middle Atlantic states. Over New Jersey, the storm turned more easterly and headed slowly across the tip of Long Island. For 12 hours, the hurricane grazed the coast as it headed out to the North Atlantic. But the northern wing stretched out over the hills of northern Connecticut and southern Massachusetts. Sheets of rain began covering Connecticut on the 17th and persisted into the next day. I know something was wrong because it never rained that hard. It would rain, it never rained that hard. The rain just came down in torrents all night long. I couldn't sleep. The rain was so uh, noisy. It was just pounding all night long. In Waterbury on the 18th, hundreds of people gathered downtown to take part in ceremonies honoring the famous actress Rosalind Russell, who was visiting her hometown for the premiere of the movie The Girl Rush. There were major events. There was a parade. There was a handing over the key to the city by the mayor and uh, that sort of thing. And then at night at the State Theater was the premiere. And it rained all day long. None of the events were washed out, but they were pretty wet. And I remember ducking into City Hall uh, after uh, coming across the street, and it was uh, just a downpour all day long. In a rainy but enthusiastic setting, Rosalind Russell comes back to the town where she was born, Waterbury, Connecticut. Arriving at City Hall with her husband, producer Fred Brisson, she is greeted by crowds hailing the hometown girl who made good on stage and screen. Joining Miss Russell are Mayor Raymond E. Snyder of Waterbury and Gloria DeHaven, who is her co-star in her latest hit, The Girl Rush, which is to have a local world premiere. Within hours of the celebration, the lives of thousands of people in Waterbury and dozens of other towns in Connecticut would be forever changed. By midnight on August 18th, the accumulated rainfall had reached 14 inches of northwestern hills. 16 inches alone had fallen in Winstead, just north of Torrington. Ground saturated by Hurricane Carney a week earlier just bubbled with water. Mountain streams and brooks flowed over their banks and cascaded on the steep hillsides towards the large rivers that cut through the state and route to Long Island Sound. The Great Flood had begun. I should have been in New Hampshire that particular week at the University of New Hampshire Summer Youth Music School, and, and there'd been a break outburst of infantile paralysis, so they'd postponed it till I was home to receive the flood in my front yard. Well, having lived in the Brooklyn section of Waterbury years prior, uh, every year the river came up and flooded the house, the basement, you know, just a little bit, so uh, there was really no, no uh, concern, you know. We, had no need to leave the house because of what we had remembered, you know, prior to it. But uh, it was a Connecticut light and power truck going up and down the street, you know, a huge truck with loudspeaker asking everybody to evacuate because the river was rising. We were concerned. We'd already had a foretaste of this when we got up because uh, my wife, who cooks with gas, noticed that the gas stove acted very odd. Instead of having blue flames, you know, as burners usually do, they were yellow. And then we heard from her mother that the, over the radio it was said that you should not use your gas stove, shut it off. The mains had been broken. Torrington, where the east and west branches of the Naugatuck River converge, 
absorbed the first blow from the flood. Mayor William Carroll telephoned the governor Abraham Ribicoff shortly after midnight and said that the city was in serious trouble. The governor mobilized the National Guard and told Mayor Carroll that he would rush to Torrington from Hartford. The governor never made it. All roads near the city were washed out. It was just uh, flowing down Main Street uh, here. The water was uh, deep and there were uh, articles that were floating along. And you could see car tops here and there. And it was uh, just a mess uh, at that time. It was just a terrible thing. To see some of these beautiful homes that were downtown here with the water rushing by and rushing into their filling their first floors and see furniture floating down the stream. It was quite a problem. The swelled river rapidly entered downtown Torrington and it slammed into the Hotchkiss Brothers lumber yard, which was near the doomed center bridge. We had uh, our lumber storage at the Church Street yard. We had 55 or 60 uh, carloads of lumber piled there for the winter because it was fall and we had to get ready for that lasts us till springtime. And 42 carloads of that went down the river. Took out the center bridge, backed up against the, the American Brass Bridge there, which leads into the yard, and, and diverted the uh, water so it went through the uh, their, one of their factories, their casting shop, I think, and came out on uh, Church Street. The lumber and debris piled up and briefly slowed the rush of the Naugatuck River above Waterbury. But across the northern tier of Connecticut, other rivers ran wild. To the north of Torrington in Winstead, the surging Mad River cut a fresh channel down Main Street, taking out buildings and bridges with a sudden fury. The power went out, telephones didn't work, and dozens were left stranded in the dark as the water scored away at the foundations of their homes. National Guard troops assigned there could not arrive for hours. So the thing about the flood is that no one knew it was coming. It was a total shock to a lot of people who didn't watch it. I watched it progress because I lived close to Main Street and saw it through the night progress and get worse and worse and worse. And the thing we thought it was going to stop, we always kept thinking it was going to stop raining. It never stopped. It just kept raining and harder and harder and harder. It was a total surprise. It was, it was absolutely a total surprise. The, uh, what, I was amazed myself that Highland Lake overflowed. Highland Lake overflowed and devastated the west end of town, including the house that I, the factory behind the house I lived in. He never gave a thought that Highland Lake would over, overflow to that extent, or that Mad River would overflow. Winston uh, has been su susceptible to floods throughout its history. And in the history, of, if you read the history of Winston, there's been floods at various stages for the last 200 years in Winston, but nothing like the 55 flood not 14 inches of rain in one night. One of the first things that happened, uh, there were two or three of us that started down Main Street when we began to see there's something wrong. There's something wrong here. That this, this water keeps rising between, between where we are now and going down Main Street for a quarter of a mile. We tried to get people to leave their homes, and they just would not leave. I guess it goes back to the old idea, your home is the safest place to be. Years later, uh, Sergeant Gableman of the police department told me that the night of the flood, he was um, in the police department, which was pretty well flooded itself. And uh, he said a young man, early at night, he said a young man stopped by in a pickup truck from out of state, and he said, he said to me, Main Street flooding, he says, can I help you do anything? And he said to him, he said, what you can do is go along all the buildings on the riverside of Main Street and knock on doors and tell people to leave their building. So he said, okay, I will. And uh, he went out and that, uh, they found his body a couple of days later in, an, in the Connecticut Light and Power lot just below the center of town. State Trooper Dick Chapman and his radio car provided the only link to the outside for hours as downtown Winston dissolved. The big problem was that, you know, the towns were completely cut off from, uh, from this storm. Uh, people from Colebrook couldn't get down into town. People from uh, New Hartford and Bar Camps, they couldn't get into Winstead. Uh, from to try and get from Torrington to Winstead, you could use that Greenwoods Road that I used, uh, although it was a couple of the small low-lying bridges had been washed out. And uh, 
it was passable. And that became like the Burma Road. I mean, you could every all emergency vehicles and stuff that eventually ran there used that road to communicate between Torrington and Winstead. The center of Winstead was just gutted out about 10 or 15 feet deep. All the utilities were gone. You know, the sewer lines, the water lines, the phone lines, the any gas lines, all just completely gutted. Plus all the stores that got washed away. Uh, we found some uh, brand new Buicks in, in Walker Field, which were had tumbled down from a, a dealership on the south side of the road. Uh, we, we found a couple of bodies also, which were dispatched improperly. In Hartford, Governor Ribicoff established emergency headquarters at 2.45 a.m. and prepared for further reports. Helicopters from Sikorsky Aircraft in Stratford, Command Aircraft in Bloomfield, and nearby military installations were pressed into service. broke on the 19th of August, the situation had worsened considerably, and the tragic dimensions of what had happened overnight unfolded in villages such as Washington Depot and Unionville. In Woodville, above Washington Depot, the debris from the surging Sheepog River clogged a culvert under a bridge on Route 25. The water accumulated behind the culvert and spread over homes in the area. The water rose up to uh, within two bricks of the top of our house. Our major concern was to get our animals out. At the time we had sheep, we broke the fence open so that the sheep could go to higher ground on their own. We managed to get all our um, dogs out and our cats. Rather than be in a bridge, there were th three or four culverts in there, and these culverts got blocked up with refuse, and uh, they just uh, beca it became a dam, and the water backed up the river, probably north of that, about half a mile or maybe a mile. And then, at seven o'clock in the morning, two trailer trucks came down 202 from Montauk, and they crossed over uh, this flooded area, and they no sooner got across than this whole thing just burst, and it came down through the valley and just scoured the valley out. A wall of water poured from the broken culvert and headed rapidly towards Washington Depot and its cluster of homes and buildings. The surge wiped out buildings and carried the debris downriver to a bridge in the center of town. The flood toppled a home near the Green Hill Bridge and it carried it down the Sheepog River. And what I was seeing when this voice building went down was the height of this water coming down through. And uh, it, it uh, just was too much water for this voice building. Plus, a uh, tree came down uh, Titus Road and hit the building at that uh, time. So the building just popped up and down it went. Many, many buildings were destroyed. The Washington Furniture Shop, which stood north of the Green Hill Bridge, uh, maybe by about one mile, came down the river, and parts of the roof came to rest on top of the Green Hill Bridge. But water was going right over the top of the Green Hill Bridge, and cars were coming over the top of it, and all kinds of... Uh, uh, house parts and trees. Mr. and Mrs. William Falloy were killed. 
Others were saved by the sheer heroics of their neighbors. To the east, in Unionville, New Hartford, and Collinsville, the Farmington River struck with a fury that underscored the nickname of a bend in it, Satan's Kingdom. During the night, the Naugatuck River reached full fury as a debris dam south of Torrington broke. The waters raced towards Waterbury and the towns further down river. Few could ever imagine what was about to happen there at first light. The flood of 55... And we are marking the 50th anniversary of the flood of 55 in Connecticut uh, today on CPTV. And we urge you to go to the phone and become a member here at this station. This is a CPTV original and a show that we produced 10 years ago for the 40th anniversary. We're so very proud of it. And at this time, we are remembering the victims, the survivors, recognizing the heroism that occurred during those horrible days in August of 1955. And we urge you to call us, make a pledge, and tell us your story. We would love for you to make that call right now and say thank you to CPTV because who else would produce a program like this one but your local PBS station? My name is Lee Newton. I am joined by Tanya Meck, and we have wonderful volunteers ready to take your call from Derby High School National Honor Society. And we have other great friends of CPTV, good volunteers who are here often and ready to take your call. So. Go to the phone right now and do it at 1-800-683-2112. It's an important time to go to the phone because we actually have a member challenge in effect. Our existing members are going to match every single pledge that comes in. So if you can make a $60 pledge, that will be $120 going right to work for more historical documentaries like this one, more CPTV originals, telling Connecticut stories, and that is what CPTV does so well. We can do that with your pledge of support. We also have a goal of $5,000 for this program and we can do it if you make the call. Now you can join us at any level that you feel comfortable with. It might be $35 or $50 but for a $60 pledge, we have the VHS of the program that you're watching, The Flood of 55, and we would love to send it to you as our way of thanking you for your membership. And, of course, you're going to see everything that you see in the program this evening, the amazing archival footage that was found, the photographs. Everything is here for you. If you would like to add this to your video collection, make a $60 pledge right now. And now we'll go to Tanya Mech. That's right, Lee. Original documentaries about Connecticut is one of the things that CPTV does best. You know, you can turn on your television, switch through the channels, and nowhere else are you going to get information about your home state and your region. Information and pictures and footage that touch the lives of many people right here in the state of Connecticut. Nobody else is going to bring this to you but CPTV. We can do that because of the dedicated support of our members. As Lee mentioned, one way to gauge what you want to see is by calling up and making a pledge right now. You see the number on your screen. Please go to the phone. We've got wonderful volunteers right here from the Derby National Honor Society waiting to take your call and those for those of you who are watching who lived through this very uh, stressful terrible time in Connecticut's history as a matter of fact it's the greatest natural disaster that Connecticut has ever experienced I'm sure that the powerful images evoke really strong memories uh, of a very quite frankly horrifying time and for those of you who haven't lived through it, for those of us who haven't lived through it, this is a very powerful history lesson, something that teaches us about one of the most important parts of Connecticut's history, something that changed uh, the landscape altogether, not only the physical landscape, but the hearts and the minds of the people who lived through it. So come to the phone, tell us that you'd like to see more original documentaries about the state and the life in Connecticut by picking up the phone, 1-800-683. 2112. The most important thing about becoming a member is that you're supporting good quality local programming. But we always like to say thank you for you calling up and making that gift and that pledge. And one of the ways we do that is by offering you gifts as our way of saying thank you. If you'd like to join us at the $150 level, 
we've got a four pack that you see it on your screen of VHS CPTV originals. Again, that's for the $150 pledge. It includes the Circus Fire, which was July in 1944 when the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Big Top caught fire. When Disaster Struck Connecticut, which is a compilation of a storm known as King Blizzard, two floods of near biblical proportions, and the most destructive hurricane in Connecticut's history. And then a little lighter fare with Remember When, which is a nostalgic look at life in, the Connecticut, in Connecticut in the 1940s and 1950s. And of course, in that four pack, you'll get the Flood of 55, which is this captivating program that you're watching right now here on CPTV. Again, local documentaries is a thing that we do best. You'll see our volunteers there on your TV screen, ready and willing to take your call. We're blessed with so many people wanting to volunteer here at CPTV. In fact, I'm a volunteer and a member of CPTV, and I'm here tonight asking you to join me because I value quality public television. Whether it's the children's shows, the documentaries, and the original programs, these are the things that I and my family want to watch. So won't you join me? 1-800-683-2112. Lee? And as I look around the studio, I see we've got a lot of volunteers on the phone right now. That is very heartening for us to see. This is a program that was supported and funded by members, by people just like you. There was no corporation that stood up to fund this, but we thought it was important enough that we bring it to you, that we take the, make the commitment, the financial commitment, do the research, bring it all together, because this was a story that indeed needed to be told. And if you recognize that and you see that Connecticut Public Television tells Connecticut stories like no other station around. And of course, we have many wonderful local stations. They do wonderful news. But long-form documentaries is really not what the other stations do. That is truly our specialty. And if you recognize that we are a nonprofit organization, we have no advertisers, we have no shareholders, we are here funded by the public, by people just like you, then be a part of it right now. Go to the phone. You're going to feel great. And you will pick up, of course, the video, perhaps, of the flood of 55. You will bring those memories home with you and have that as a historical document in your collection. That's important to you. Then go to the phone right now. We have many different VA VHSs that you can choose from of local documentaries we produced in the past. The horrific Hartford Circus Fire, we have that available and that these are all actually produced by Rich Hanley, a fantastic uh, producer here. When disasters struck Connecticut, looking at disasters that occurred in the early part of the century, the hurricanes, the blizzards, of course, the flood of 55. Remember when is a wonderful, nostalgic look back at the trolleys, at the movie houses of the 1940s and 50s. And of course, you can choose flood of 55, the show that you're watching right now. But by all means, go to the phone, bring your credit card over, and tell us that you believe in CPTV Originals and you'd like us to continue to bring you more programs like this. It's a simple thing to do. Just call us up 1-800-683-2112 or log on to cptv.org and hit Easy Pledge. Tanya. Well, our phones are ringing, so you must agree with us that original documentaries are one of the things that we do best and one of the things that you want to see. And we've talked a little bit about our goal for the program of $5,000, and it's really important for us to set goals because that's how we make our budget and break it up into manageable pieces, but also because it tells us what you as the viewer want to see. If you like this program, if you want us to produce more local documentaries about important moments in Connecticut's history, about current events that are happening right here in your state, it's important that you pick up the phone and join us at 1-800-683-2112. You know, I can tell from the response of the phones that this is really something that's important to you. So if you've been thinking about becoming a member, thinking about CPTV, thinking that you should pick up the phone, now's the time to do it. It's simple, it's painless, just have your major credit card ready, pick up the phone and call. It'll take a minute or two and it's something that you can cross off that to-do list if you're thinking about it. Uh, I appreciate the programs. I really got to become a member and you're running around. Take a moment out of your hectic evening. Pick up the phone, call us, join the CPTV family, join our very distinguished list of members and donors here at CPTV. We'd like to say thank you to you for doing that. And of course, one of the ways we can do that is with a thank you gift. We're only suggesting different levels to you. Of course, you can do anything that fits your budget or your pocketbook. But for a donation of $40, we'd like to send you the CPTV license plate. So not only do you get your Connecticut Magazine, you get a year subscription to the Connecticut Magazine. You see that there on your screen, one of our recent editions. But you also get this license plate holder. And the wonderful thing about this is you can drive around and show everybody what good taste you have in TV and radio by showing that you're a CPT member. And we'd like to send that to you for your $40 pledge. Lee? 
And I do want to take a moment to thank Highland Park Market. They have donated food for our volunteers, and our volunteers are staying busy. They are on the phone right now, but you are still uh, welcome to call us up and make that pledge right now around the flood of 55. It's an important program, certainly one of the most devastating events in Connecticut history, and we're remembering it with this program on the 50th anniversary. So join us right now, and I can tell you a program like this uh, is the kind of thing that may look simple. You may not think much about it, but it's a very expensive thing to do. When you look at the time, the research, the archival footage, everything that needed to be put together, that is frankly some of the most expensive type of programming that you can produce. Reality shows, those are easy, they're cheap, but when you do long form historical documentaries the way that we do, that is expensive and that takes member support. So if you want to make more shows like this happen, the best way to do it is to go to the phone and become a member here at CPTV and you are going to feel great about doing it. Now remember for a $60 pledge we can send you the Flood of 55 on VHS, we would love to send that to you. We also have for a $100 pledge the um, CPTV Deluxe Logo Package, which is our CPTV tote bag and mug. And of course, we love those in public television, mugs and tote bags. If you'd like to have it, make a $100 pledge. But in just a few seconds, we're going to be going back to the second segment of the Flood of 55. Watch, enjoy, remember, but by all means, do give us a call. Thank you. Tons of debris and mud accumulated by the Naugatuck River in Torrington and Thomaston bore down on Waterbury and its tightly packed homes and factories. The residents were unprepared for the onslaught that came in the pre-dawn darkness. We'd heard, obviously, the forecasts of heavy rain. We knew that there had been rain the weekend before and uh, realized later, thinking back about it, that the ground was saturated and there was a lot of runoff. We didn't have any, uh, any indication that it was coming. We knew that there, we were getting the after effects of a, of a uh, hurricane and all of that, but nothing of this magnitude. In the Brooklyn section of Waterbury, the river swirled through darkened basements and threatened to carry homes and the people with them further downriver towards Union City and Naugatuck. Victoria Duncan felt the water rise in her bed as she tried to sleep, even as the world around her was collapsing. We had to sleep on like a bed couch which was on the floor. And so um, mom was going out that night. She had a babysitter with us. And I remember that while I was sleeping, um, all of a sudden I felt something that was creeping up over my feet. And uh, I didn't know what it was, you know. I thought maybe it was a snake or something because I am deaf. So to hear the sound of water, never occurred to me that we were having a flood that night. <laughs> so I screamed and jumped up. My mother had came in to pick us up, and that's when I realized that uh, we were in the middle of a flood. And uh, my mother had to get us out of the house and everything, and it was very frightening for me. Emma Coleman, Victoria's mother, decided to stay home that night, and as a result, she saved her children. Only thing I heard was this water running in the kitchen. So I got the girls and brought them out and taking them out and carried them upstairs. And so uh, I went back in the house to get some clothes for the kids and for myself. But I didn't get nothing for myself. I just had on a, a big coat, trench coat, and had some boots on. And I got a few of the kids' clothes, and I brought them out. So I gonna go back in there to get some more things out. He said, you better not go back in there because the water was coming out the window. So I was going to go in there and get my record player. He said, you better not go in there. So I went on in there and I seen brand new shoes floating on the water. And the curfew, it was pushing me around like I was going like this, you know. So I didn't get the record player. So I came out. The water savagely attacked Ward's flats in its rows of homes that were nestled on the riverside. It swept the buildings downriver into other structures in a grim tableau of death and destruction. It was the worst thing I had, I'd ever seen. You know, just looking out the window of the third floor, all you could see was water. It was like an ocean of water. And uh, the Connecticut Light and Power 
and the CRNL bus lines were directly across the river from us, and you can see the buses just floating like they were toys. They just couldn't believe it. You know, automobiles going down. It wasn't even the river anymore. The whole street was the river. So just cars were just passing by like toys. It's just unbelievable. Police, firefighters, volunteers, and neighbors risked their lives in Ward's Flats, Brooklyn, and other sections of Waterbury, trying to save people that were trapped in their homes as the debris-filled water relentlessly passed at speeds that hit 50 miles an hour. The Naugatuck River covered large sections of Waterbury and even forced people who lived on hills to find even higher ground. Our house, uh, it's, it stayed. It didn't uh, move off the foundation. There were two houses up. The water had, had been swirling and it was undermining the foundation. And, and this was what created the, uh, the concern to get out of the house. We thought if that house, if the foundation were eaten away by the water, it would rise and, and hit the house next door, which in turn would hit ours. So they decided to get us out of there very quickly, seeing what was happening. And we stood about halfway up the West Main Street Hill. We call it West Side Hill. Stood about halfway up with water lapping at our feet halfway up the hill, watching a freight car, railroad freight car, swirl around in a whirlpool of water over top of the bridge that I'd come across the night before on the bus. By 8 a.m. on the 19th, Waterbury was in trouble. Mayor Snyder frantically called Governor Ribicoff and asked for help of any kind. Military helicopters began flying in at first light, and they swarmed to Waterbury to rescue the stranded. As the surge crested in Waterbury and it headed towards Union City, many helicopters knifed through the river valley in a search for survivors. Dozens of people were rescued.
The surge ripped away homes, factories, railroad tracks, bridges, and gas tanks as it headed towards Union City in the town of Naugatuck. It was just unbelievable to see the, the number of buildings that were destroyed, the major destruction to railroads and roads and bridges. Uh, it was just uh, was nothing that any of us, especially at my age, uh, had ever either experienced or anticipated. It's like looking at the, at the result of a war, a bombing. We were much better off in the, the upper end of Waterbury instead of the lower end because we did you know, lose a lot of friends down on the Brooklyn section and everything else, you know, when the houses were swept away by the, by the water. But uh, we, we just happened to be luckier than most, I guess. The river pounded Waterbury without mercy. Just to the south, meanwhile, in Union City, the residents felt the onslaught and they tried to flee. Some could not, as the water lashed their homes and swept away everything that they owned. Joni Seastrand and her mother both desperately clung to furniture as their home began to move down river. A helicopter came like midday and uh, tried to rescue us and everything and I just bolted away from my mother. I just wouldn't go. And then the house collapsed. It got uh, hit by the block up the street from us. The dirt porch came off from the oil tanks up near Arlen's at the time, and a boxcar. And it came and it took our house right off its foundation and we floated down the river and hung onto an apple tree. A helicopter there tried making an attempt again and I still refused to go. And uh, causing my mother to break her wrist with a bureau crashing onto it. And then uh, the guy just couldn't stay. He had too many other people in the area to help. And then 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the Coast Guard, Sikorsky Coast Guard, came with a yellow, helico yellow hel helicopter and a basket. And uh, I went in that. Just below Union City, the town of Naugatuck braced for high water and the debris that it carried. The word had already reached the town that gas tanks dislodged in Waterbury were headed for Naugatuck and its two main bridges. Petroleum tanks were down near the gas works, and uh, that was a distribution center of gasoline and kerosene and stuff like that. And eventually, they became dislodged from the water force in Waterbury. Of course, in Waterbury and Naugatuck, we had the accumulation of the whole uh, rise of the river up from uh, Winston, Torrington, and so forth, and. Uh, once they became dislodged, they were carried down the river, and in the Union City section, the northern section of Naugatuck, we had an iron bridge, a big uh, iron bridge built by the Berlin Iron Bridge Company, and uh, that, I think, was put up about 1890, somewhere around there. And once those tanks, with the force of the water behind them, hit the bridge, they smashed that bridge down.
Town residents who had earlier had a chance to leave now found that they could not evacuate as the river raced around them. Workers were trapped on factory roofs as the water breached the walls and it rose quickly. We had warned the people who lived along the river bank, they all were warned about the flood, or what was, what was happening above. And uh, most of the people moved out. A lot of people moved out, but a lot of people didn't move out. And the people who didn't move out, by the time the flood got to where, almost to its peak, there was no way that anybody could get in to these people. It was almost impossible. There were some people that were saved, but the ones that weren't, it was almost impossible to, uh, to get into them. The destruction upriver soon repeated itself in Ansonia. The homes of factory workers lined the banks of the Naugatuck River, and many were reduced to rubble as the flood reached the high water mark. The river covered downtown Ansonia. We were asleep in that morning, and my father, who was divorced from my mother, called and told us there was a flood. We lived on the third floor. We got out of bed, there was my brother, my mom, and myself. We looked out and the water was raging. And in front of our house was, we lived on a slope. There was a six foot fence and the water already was over that six foot fence. We didn't know anything was going on. And as the waters were going, damage was being caused. Uh, cars were floating down, no drivers had uplifted the cars and the cars were floating down in all the debris. And there was two very nice furniture stores. One was Spectre's and one was Pearson's very expensive furniture stores and we were low-income people we didn't have a lot of money and nice things and the windows broke and as the furniture was coming out of the windows all the people were pulling it in with poles pulling furniture into their homes people actually dove into the water to get the furniture they filled their house with furniture elsewhere in Connecticut the flood continued to ravage communities in Seymour, a cemetery was overrun, and coffins popped out of the ground, and they were carried away by the swift current. Downtown Bristol was washed away. And in Putnam, the Quinnebog River smashed into a magnesium factory, ignited a fire just before dawn, and that fire burnt for hours.
Even in Hartford, which had the best flood protection, the relentless rain caused the Park and the Connecticut rivers to both jump over their protective dikes. Dozens of people were left trapped in their homes. We hope you're enjoying when I When I see images like this, I think of them happening somewhere else, maybe another country, maybe another state, Florida, California, and certainly not Connecticut. But here it is, right in front of us on our TV set, showing us that the wrath of Mother Nature can happen anywhere, even in our home state. Hi, I'm Tanya Meck. I'm joined in the CPTV studios by Lee Newton. And we're here tonight showing you and bringing you the Flood of 55, asking you to support programs like this and become a member here at CPTV. Go to your phone right now, pick it up, call 1-800-683-2112. You see that number on your screen. Tell us that you appreciate local programs, documentaries about the state and the region that you live in. Now, you might get coverage about the Flood of 55. You may have seen it recently in one of your papers. There was a front page picture, articles on the 50th anniversary of the flood of 55, but nowhere are you going to get the in-depth coverage, the first-hand accounts of the survivors, the dramatic footage that you're watching and listening to right now, but here on your local public television station, CPTV. So we know that you're enjoying the program, we know that you're watching it, and you like to hear more about your state and learn about the history of Connecticut, and the way that you can show us is by calling up and becoming a member. We've mentioned earlier in our show that we've got a goal of $5,000. We're about $2,000, a little, uh, almost halfway there. So help us reach that goal and tell us that you like and value local programs based in your community and about the history of your community by calling 1-800-683-2112. We've got a couple different ways to say thank you. Now, of course, if you just want to call up and become a member or if you're already a member and want to support local programs like this and make an additional gift, that's great. Uh, you don't have to ask for a thank you gift. We don't have to send that to you. It's just a nice thing that we can do if you want the gift as our way of saying thank you. You can pledge at any level that makes sense for you. In fact, if you uh, like the Flood of 55 and want to have these images for your library so that you can watch it again or perhaps you've experienced it and you want to show it to other people and talk about your own memories, you can call up for a pledge of $60 and get the VHS of the Flood of 55. There's some other things that we can do to say thank you at any level, but the important thing is that you get up and you call right now. Support local documentaries here at CPTV. Lee. That's right. Go to the phone right now at 1-800-683-2112 and make a pledge of support. This is a program that we thought was so important to bring back on the 50th anniversary of the flood of 55. Perhaps your interest has been piqued. There have been many stories in newspapers of recent days recounting the events of the flood, the amazing loss of life, the heroism, the relief efforts. And you look at footage in this program and to see it and to see the devastation for firsthand to see the streets that are destroyed, the buildings that have been upended. It is hard for someone who, like myself, who didn't live through that, to imagine that that could have happened, that today's Waterbury, today's Torrington, today's Winstead could look the way that it does in this footage, but truly that is what happened and uh, the stories are amazing. In the next segment, we're really going to look at the relief efforts and uh, it is a certainly a testament to the people of Connecticut, the way that they came together, they helped one another, they rebuilt these towns and rebuilt their lives. and. Um, it, it is an amazing story, and if you appreciate watching it here on Connecticut Public Television, I hope you'll recognize the fact that no other station will bring you a program of this length, of this long format, of this quality. And we are able to do this, frankly, because of members, because of people just like you who came forward and made a pledge of support some time ago, and we were able to have the financial wherewithal to produce programs like this. There are more Connecticut stories to be told, and we would like to tell them, but it takes member support to make it happen. Now, we have a goal of $5,000. Last I heard, we had $2,700 to go to meet that goal, so we're just about halfway there. But if you can go to the phone right now, like so many people are doing, then you are really going to do something something important for Connecticut and for your community. And uh, we have there the Derby High School National Honor Society answering phones. We have other good friends of CPTV. 
why not join them? Our basic membership begins uh, $35. You can join us at the $40 level, or if you choose, make a $150 pledge. We have the CPTV Original Combo, four amazing historical documentaries, all produced by CPTV, that chronicle the circus fire in Hartford when disaster struck Connecticut, looking at the blizzard, some of the uh, amazing floods that we have had, uh, hurricanes that have hit the state in the early part of the century. Remember When, which is a light, nostalgic look at Hartford and New Haven, the trolleys, the big movie houses, and of course the flood of 55. You can have them all for a $150 pledge. So why not bring your credit card over to the phone, give us a call. It's going to take 60 seconds of your time, and you will do something important for your community and public television here in Connecticut. And now let's go back to Tanya Mack. Lee and I are encouraging you to join as members today because it's important, but also because now is a very good time to become a member. If you've been thinking about it and you've been putting it off, do it now because we have a matching gift challenge from our current members. That's right, our members are so committed to public television and so supportive that they've offered to match any donation that you make tonight. So if you make a $50 donation, we get $100. This is a great thing for our members to do for us and to show their commitment to CPTV, and we hope that you'll take advantage of that by joining us this evening, picking up the phone and calling 1-800-683-2112. If you'd like to go online, that's easier, cptv.org. You can go online and make your donation that way. You see on your video screen, we have got a lot of volunteers here who are manning the phones, happy to take your calls, wanting to talk to you. You know, it's the National uh, Honor Society of Derby High School, and so since they're the National Honor Society. I'm sure they're very good at history and they know all about the flood of 55. But if you don't, this is a great way to learn about a very important part of Connecticut's history, something that changed our landscape forever, the hearts, the minds, the physical landscape of the citizens of Connecticut. Right here, we're bringing that to you. We have a whole line of original documentaries about Connecticut, and Lee had mentioned some of those that we can make available to you for a pledge of $60. One is the program that you're watching right now, The Flood of 55. We also have Circus Fire, which is another disaster that happened in Connecticut. We've got um, When Disaster Struck, which is actually four disasters all packaged in one video and then remember when which is a much more lighthearted look at Connecticut history the 1940s and the 1950s in Connecticut all originally produced here at CPTV about Connecticut history something that brings history alive it's not just hearing about it or reading it about it in a textbook it's actually seeing it and learning about it so this isn't just something that somebody might want to look at who has lived through one of these disasters or who grew up in the 40s and 50s and wants to look back but it's also a great teaching tool and one of the reasons that I value CPTV and that I'm a member. I'll turn CPTV on and I'll be entertained and I'll be educated. And this is one example of those educational shows that we can produce here for you at CPTV. Right, Lee? That's right. There's so much that we can do with member support, and that's frankly the way we want to do it. We don't want to be beholden to any advertisers, to anyone. The best way for us, of course, as a public television station, is to produce the programs that you want to see. And that's what Flood of 55 is all about. And we have done numerous programs over the years telling Connecticut stories, whether it was Connecticut for all seasons, looking at the beauty, the landscape of Connecticut through all four seasons, the Connecticut River. We did a wonderful documentary looking at the history of the Connecticut River. You're on the air, the history of television in Connecticut. We have done numerous shows over the years, and there's so many more stories to tell. We can do it if you go to the phone and make a pledge, because this is a vote. This is a vote of confidence that when you make your pledge, we're going to record that. We're going to make note that we got an amazing amount of support around a local documentary because you wanted to see more programs like this. If that is true, then don't wait for another night. Let this be the time that you go to the phone and support CPTV originals like the Flood of 55 on your local PBS station, CPTV. We have a goal of $5,000. We have $2,100 to go, so we are working our way there, but we would love to invite you to become a member right now at 1-800-683-2112. I want to thank Highland Park Market. They have been wonderful to donate food and drinks for our volunteers, and we couldn't do it without them, and of course we can't do it without you either. So why not go to the phone and uh, be a member right here at CPTV. You can join us at the $40 level. We have a great item. This is our membership license plate holder and you can tell everyone that you are a CPTV member with this license plate holder or if you'd like go up to $150 and we have a wonderful combo of videotapes available for you. You can choose 
you get all four of them, the circus fire when disaster struck Connecticut, remember when, and of course the flood of 55, all for a pledge of $150. And remember the flood of 55 alone VHS is a $60 pledge. So give us a call, talk to our volunteers. They would love to help you be a member of CPTV right now. And let's, let's now go to Tanya. Lee, we're making progress towards our goal of $5,000. We're at about $3,600, and that's due to you calling tonight to support this original CPT program. So before we move on, I want to say thank you to those of you who have called already and ask those of you who are considering it to please pick up the phone and call during this break to show us that you value these types of programs here on CPTV. You know, Lee talked a little bit about how important it is for our members to support programs that you want to see. The fact of the matter is that 75% of our income, of our operating income here at CPTV comes from our members, people just like you, not from advertisers, not from sponsors. Every once in a while you'll see a particular program sponsored by a corporation or a business, but the fact is that's a very small percentage of our revenue here. We make programs like the Flood of 55 with your support. Again, 75% of the money that we raise here at CPTV comes from you. So if you want to see more programs like this, if you value the local documentaries, please pick up your phone and call us at 1-800-683-2112. We mentioned our goal. We mentioned our matching gifts. Now is the time to do it. If you've been thinking about joining us, please do so now so we can make your money double. We'd appreciate it. We appreciate you watching this program and showing your support. You know, it's great to be here in the studio this evening and hear the phones ring because that tells us that you want to see more programs like this, not just historical documentaries, but we've got so much thing, so many other things to offer about current events, things that are happening here and now in Connecticut that we're ready to bring you with your support. 1-800-683. 32112. Lee? Yes, go to the phone right now. Make that pledge of support. And you know, a lot of people think, hey, I pay my cable bill. Surely some of that money must go to public television. Well, no, I'm afraid it doesn't. Uh, we have no state operating uh, support coming in right now. We have very little federal support coming in. So honestly, the majority, the bulk of our funding, as Tanya was saying, comes from the community, comes from people like you. So if this is what you want to see, then go to the phone and make a pledge because this is a grand democracy that we have here at Public Television. When shows work, when people respond, you'll see more shows like it. Look at UConn women's basketball. That very first game that we broadcast way back in 1994, and we had pledge breaks, and if it had been silent, you never would have seen another UConn women's basketball game on CPTV again. But, you know, the people spoke up. You spoke up. You wanted to see more programs like that, and look at what we've created over the past decade. We can do more things like the flood of 55 if you show your support support right now by going to the phone at 1-800-683-2112 and making a pledge. You can also go to our website at cptv.org and click on Easy Pledge. That is a very easy way for people to make pledges as well. But you choose, you choose the amount, whatever's comfortable for you. It might be $60. A lot of people are picking up the Flood of 55 on VHS for a $60 pledge. So that might be the item for you to choose. But go to the phone right now, use your credit card, and join us at 1-800-683-2112 just given us a couple ideas of different levels to pledge at. Whatever fits for you, for your pocketbook, for your budget, that's what makes sense for us. That's what public television is all about. You decide what you want to support and at what level. So Lee had mentioned $60 levels. We also, for the $150 level, have a four-pack of Connecticut uh, Public Television Originals for you that we'd love to send you for the $150 pledge. It includes the program that you're watching right now, The Flood of 55. It includes Circus Fire, a terrible time in Connecticut's history. When disaster struck which is actually about four natural disasters in Connecticut and then remember when a much more lighthearted look at life in the 1940s and 1950s in our state. It's a great way if you're uh, appreciating what you're seeing in Flood of 55 and want to see a few of the other CPT originals that we produce. The $150 pledge level might be the right one for you. Of course, again, any pledge level is correct. It's whatever you feel like you're capable of giving, and you get to put the value on what you're watching right now. So uh, pledge drives really are the most honest thing in television. You're actually simply paying for a service that you've already been using. You know what it's worth, and we ask you to make that call, 1-800-683-2112 for a pledge of $40 we'd like to send you our Connecticut license plate along with the year subscription to the Connecticut magazine. Again, if you don't want any of these gifts, that's fine. It's just a nice way for us to say thank you. But the important thing is that you get to the phone and join us right now, 1-800-683-2112, and thank you in advance.
flood ended by late afternoon on the 19th of August. Stunned survivors could not believe the death and destruction that surrounded them. The tragedies were many. Harold Bouchard of New Hartford lost his wife, two daughters, and a niece. Frank Luckingham, who lived on a Connecticut River houseboat, was killed by the river that he called home. Mrs. Leon Bashad's seven-year-old daughter perished in Unionville. Survivors were left stunned and sobbing at the wreckage. They were terrible, terribly drunk. So, so many people were uh, immigrants, you know, from Polish immigrants that came to this country right after the war. Uh, and they were settled that, and they were had little apartments, and they were getting somewhere, and this was all gone. No insurance, you know, at that time you couldn't get blood insurance. So it was, it was tough. On, it was an average working person that lived down there, you know, man, and a while, both worked, some of them had three, four children, all that was gone. People were very desperate. It was sad to look at them, and they couldn't believe it that we were going to help them financially and with food and clothing. I remember we had a man who had a store on Main Street, a butcher store, and he lost everything. He was a single person, and uh, he was, we put him in a home with a, another family because he couldn't take care of himself. He was in about 60 years old, and he was so desperate that they couldn't control him there. So we, my my pastor and I, decided to take him to we uh, to the uh, to the where the doctor said that he has to be put away. So he we were driving him up to Newtown, uh, that was a home for uh, people, mental people, and he opened the car and he almost jumped out. If it wasn't for me, he would have killed himself. And these were so many cases where people were desperate. Desperate, very desperate. District Chief Robert Fleming of the Army Corps of Engineers commented, this storm did as much damage in southern New England as three years of warfare had done to the Ruhr Valley in Germany. Leading just being a kid there and not really understanding what was going on and then, you know, just losing everything. I had a party down at the shore and then that hurricane there, we had to leave there. And they celebrated my birthday and I had all new toys and clothes and bicycles and, you know, I didn't understand. I didn't have anything anymore and everything. My parents, you know, they lost everything, everything out of their house and they didn't have a home after. 
We had to live with friends. The death toll continued to rise into the evening. 14 bodies were found in Waterbury. Another 10 bodies were recovered downriver in Naugatuck. Torrington lost six people. The list of casualties continued to grow as people reported to be missing were found dead. Some of them were miles from their homes. The people that lost their lives in Winstead and New Hartford and Bark Hampstead and uh, Collinsville and down through there along the Farmington River, it was like a game of inches, I always thought later. You could be here and be fine. You could be 10 feet away and be lost. Um, it, it didn't seem to pick and choose. It, you, if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, you were going to be drowned. The relief effort began as soon as the rivers receded into their normal channels. Thousands of people who lost their homes filled school gymnasiums, auditoriums, and churches. Over 5,000 of the injured filled hospital beds. By the end of the day, people began the monumental task of rebuilding. National Guard units patrolled towns to stop looting. The American Red Cross established relief centers wherever they were needed. And typhoid medicines, food, water, and other supplies were ferried by helicopters from town to town. The outpouring of support was enormous. This uh, radio People came into City Hall and they wanted somebody to talk a couple of minutes. And I was elected. So I did, and I got paid for it. One silver dollar, which I contributed to the Red Cross, which was also working at City Hall. And uh, a week or so afterwards, I got a telephone call from a woman in Ohio wanted to know if their Rotary Club could do something for Torrington. I said, gee, I don't know. I says, maybe if they'd send a little clothing or something, some of the people might need it. Well, that was okay, but Two or three weeks afterwards, two truckloads of clothing came into town for the Rotary Club to help out the people in Torrington. Within days of the flood, President Eisenhower flew over the area and later asked Congress for the largest federal flood relief program up to that time. Senator Prescott Bush visited areas leveled by the flood, and he was so moved, he made sure that Congress passed several flood relief and control bills. Meanwhile, the Corps of Engineers moved tons of debris away from the rivers, and those mountains of debris were set afire. The fires burned for 24 hours a day for weeks after the devastation. Every night uh, when they were taking down the buildings, they would take it all to their local dump and it every it would the dump but then was burning 24 hours a day well they would really get it going at night and each night a different fire company would go down and watch the dump because of the tremendous amount of flames that would you know in the heat they didn't want it to get away and of course people always brought their garbage there everything was there and they were just burning wood and garbage and everything and uh, my entertainment at that time was to get out with my dad and uh, when his engine one was down there watching the place burn, and I would go down with a pellet gun, and we'd have the spotlight on the fire truck, and my hobby was to aim the spotlight and shoot rats. With 
the water mains cut, the gas lines severed, and bridges lying in ruin, survivors found that their lives had been turned upside down. The simple conveniences of modern life were gone, and some of them would not be available for many months. I remember that uh, one night, a few nights after the disaster, it rained. So we decided that we, the best thing to do was get a, into a bathing suit and take a bar of soap and sit out, go out in the backyard and soap up and be rinsed in the rain. It w wasn't the greatest, but it did work. I can remember a Narragansett Beer Company sending a truckload and I don't know how many cases of bottles of water for Torrington. It came in one afternoon, and of course that was taken care of because uh, it took uh, the water company a little while to straighten out their pipes so there was enough water to take care of Torrington's needs. For many people, the flood changed their lives in ways that could not have ever been foreseen. An Ansonia teenager met a heroic rescue worker, and they fell in love. He wore a nice little yellow scarf. I remember that so distinctly around his neck. And he'd come back and forth and say hello, and I was taken by him, that's for sure. And then when he would have his breaks, he would come, and he would sit with me. And we used to see each other on his breaks. He would come back and forth. And then he said to me, it was toward the end of the flood, and he said to me, Sylvia, he says, I'd like to take you out. And of course I said, yeah, that would be nice. My name is Shirley, it's not Sylvia. And four years later, I was walking into Sikorsky's, I was 20, and I heard someone yell, Sylvia. And I turned around and it was Pete Mataic. And I knew that he was gonna be interested in me. In Torrington, the long-planned wedding of Bill and Judy Slade went on just as scheduled. I was still wondering if I was going to go through with it, but then when you think you plan for a year, are you going to do it again? <laughs> it was just a little bit too much, so we decided to go ahead with it. Some interesting things that uh, uh, happened on that Friday. Um, she had to get permission to go downtown to get her gown out of a store. Uh, which was on the second floor, and they got a boat, went over and went upstairs and, and got in. Um, our tuxes washed away through a store. It was on the first floor, and we weren't able to get them. Survivors of the Great Flood of 1955 moved on with their lives and rebuilt entire communities. In the end, the losses were incalculable for people who lost friends, families, and personal treasures. And for everyone in the path of the water, the flood turned out to be a clear dividing point between the old and the new, both in their towns and in their lives. All who lived through the Flood of 55 were never the same. The Flood of 55 on Connecticut Public Television. This is a program that we produced 10 years ago for the 40th anniversary. It is now the 50th anniversary, and we're bringing it to you again. And we had a goal of $5,000 for this program, and we are so pleased that we've actually reached that goal, and we've heard from you uh, during this broadcast, and thank you so much. Now, we are going to continue fundraising. You can send an even stronger message that this is the kind of programming that you want to see, and certainly if you 
you have not had your opportunity to go to the phone to make a pledge to perhaps pick up the flood of 55 on VHS, we're going to offer you that opportunity during these next few minutes. But by all means, if you would like to support great programs like this on CPTV, then make your voice heard by dialing 1-800-683-2112. My name is Lee Newton. I work here at CPTV. I'm joined by Tanya Mech, a wonderful volunteer and also a group of volunteers next to me who are anxious to take your call. We have the Derby High School National Honor Society here, many members from that group, and we also have some old friends of CPTV that are joining us as well, anxious to take your call. We want to thank Highland Park Market. They've donated food and drinks for our volunteers, and everybody here has done their part, and now we're asking you to do yours. If you'd like to be part of the CPTV family, to be a member, to support great programs, it's a very simple thing to do. Just go to the phone and make your pledge. And especially now because our members have put forth a challenge and they are going to match every single dollar that comes in. So if you make a $60 pledge, that is $120 that's going to go for great programming like this one, The Flood of 55. Now, if you would like to join us, you can join us at any level that you choose. But for a $60 pledge, we can send you the Flood of 55 on VHS. This is a program that you've been watching. You can't find it anywhere else. If you would like to have this, this wonderful document that really looks at the devastation, the heroism, everything that happened, the amazing survival that went on during those horrible days in August of 1955 here in Connecticut, then pick up the video as our thank you to you for supporting this station and our programming. And now let's go to Tanya Mech. As Lee mentioned, we've reached our goal. We're so pleased, but we've had so many requests for these VHS tapes. We've had people calling our, the high school students from Derby who are here with us, and they're really enjoying, I was talking to them during the break, they're really enjoying taking your call because they say the people who call up are so nice. Everybody's so supportive, and they're getting some good stories from some of you who are calling who've actually lived through the flood of 55, giving them some first count and ha uh, accounts and firsthand history lessons that they're getting from you on the phone. So please keep calling us at 1-800-683-2112, our volunteers are here to speak with you. You know, we've been talking about membership, and maybe we should tell you what exactly is a member here at CPTV. A member is somebody who's decided that they want to be active in their local public television station. We're not going to ask you to come to any meetings. We're not going to ask you to attend any events. You don't have to vote on anything. It's not going to take any other time out of your schedule than just to come and pick up the phone right now and make a contribution and become part of the CPTV family. We've got ways of saying thank you. Of course, you don't need to take a gift if you just want to become a member or just make an additional donation, that's fine too. But if you'd like to become a member at the $150 level, we've got a four pack of original CPTV documentaries. We've got Circus Fire, which is a very powerful documentary about a disaster that happened in Connecticut around the Ringling, uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. We have When Disaster Struck, which is actually four natural disasters in Connecticut. If you think this footage from Flood of 55 is powerful, you've got to see When Disaster Struck. It's a uh, very striking coverage of a couple different disasters in Connecticut's history and then remember when when trolleys roamed the streets of Hartford and New Haven and people went to the film theater and there were ushers in uniforms and it was a big social outing to go to the movies this is all documented and remember when our look back at the 40s and 50s nowhere else will you find programs like this about your community and about your state but here at CPTV and the exciting thing for us this evening is not only meeting but exceeding our goal tells us that this is what you want to see this is your chance to play programmer that's right if you think you don't have a say in what's going on in television these days, that's simply not true. By calling up and making a pledge right now, we see how well we're doing and all the pledges that are coming in. It just tells us that you want more documentaries. So we've got history to bring you. We've got lots of current events that are coming up in Connecticut that we'd like to bring you, and we can do that with your support. Right, Lee? That's right. This is how we make it work here. CPTV has been here almost 43 years now, and we've been producing programs like this one, The Flood of 55, stories of Connecticut, stories of our people, and we want to continue to do that. Just recently, we had a, a great documentary called Teens Behind the Wheel, where we monitored the driving behavior of 16 and 17-year-olds uh, with uh, cameras on the dashboard. Very interesting program indeed. We've done programs on New England and the Civil War on Nook Farm, Mark Twain's neighborhood. We have done Puerto Rican passages looking at the Puerto Rican migration to Connecticut. We've done Skimitsen looking at 
uh, that wonderful Native American celebration that happens here in Connecticut. There's so much that we can do with your support, with members, and that's really the way we want it to happen. We want members to stand up and say, I have a story for you to tell, and I'm going to help you do it with my pledge of support right now. Isn't that the way it should work in public television? That's what public television is all about. It's a great democracy where when we get calls, we can turn around and say, yes, this is indeed what you would like to see. And uh, your vote, your pledge is certainly a vote. So go to the phone right now and make a pledge for the flood of 55. This is a program that has moved you. Perhaps you lived through the events of the flood. I'm sure you were um, remembering lots of things. Maybe you've just heard about it over the years, and this was a wonderful opportunity to see it firsthand. We can certainly share the stories, but how often do you get the opportunity to see archival footage, to see the devastation, to see the people who stepped out and helped their neighbors, who saved people? This is an amazing program, an amazing event in Connecticut history, and we are recognizing it right now with this program. So why not go to the phone, make a pledge and say thanks to CPTV. Now, if you join us at the $60 level, we can send you the video of the flood of 55. We also have, for a pledge of $150, four amazing CPTV originals that are available that include flood of 55, circus fire, remember when, and when disaster struck Connecticut. So, if you'd like to have all four of these documentaries, and many people are picking these up today, then make that $150 pledge. But by all means, if this is a program that you've learned something from, that you'll be talking about tomorrow morning and talking about the events, the images that you saw, and they'll stay with you for a long time, then make a pledge for this program right now and go to the phone at 1-800-683-2112 and make that pledge of support. We're still here taking your calls because we've had such an outpouring, such a demand for the video, such a show of support for this local programming that we're still here taking your calls. We want to make sure that we get each and every one of them. Give us a call at 1-800-683-2112. Now we're wrapping up. But we still want to, we want to stay here long enough to take your call. Again, we are so thrilled and excited about the outpouring of support that we're receiving from you and from your friends and your colleagues across the state of Connecticut that we're still here ready to take your call. You know, we talked about what is a member. A member is somebody who's joined the CPT fam CPTV family and appreciates what they see. And one of the things you might appreciate is that there are no commercials. Now, if you're used to watching CPTV like I am, and then you go over to a network where there's commercials, you're probably shocked at how much time you actually spend watching commercials. The fact is that here at CPTV, we come to you with these pledge drives four times a year. That's right, only four times a year. The rest of the time, our programming is commercial-free, and that's the way it should be. We're driven by your wants and what you want to